Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 1.13, Political Changes. This is our seventh episode dealing with Jamestown, and I don't know about you guys, but I am ready to move on to different frontiers. The good news is that after this week, that is just what we are going to do. However, before we can leave Jamestown for good, we need to go back and look at the developments in the colony politically. As the colony begins to rapidly grow, the political situation begins to change. We see the first forms of government come to the colony during this period, and we are going to discuss the reasons for this and what it meant for Virginia as a whole. Following the massacre of 1622, the future of the Virginia Company would quickly be drawn into question, and by 1624, the company would meet its ultimate end. We are going to discuss the change from the Virginia Company to the Crown Colony and what that means for the future of the colony and the future of English colonization. By the end of today, we will be in a position to leave Jamestown behind. No longer the struggling colony that we have seen through much of these episodes, but rather a self-sufficient colony that would provide the early base of power in the English North American colonies. We have discussed previously that following the starving time, we see a period of near martial law take over in Virginia. We had talked about this a few weeks back when we saw that these new laws had been put into place. However, with time, a somewhat more relaxed attitude spread throughout the colony. Following the end of the First Anglo-Paladin War, things in Virginia had become relatively peaceful and prosperous for the English. With the colony being on more stable footing, it proved to be much easier to back down from the previously strict rules. When Samuel Argall arrived in the colony to take his turn as governor in 1617, he found that the colony had once again become neglected. Argall tried to retain control and issued a new set of stricter laws. However, the colonists quickly showed their dislike for this. Following a period of drought after his arrival, colonists began launching accusations at Argall for embezzling from the stores. Not wanting to let things get out of control yet again, the English sent Lord Delaware back for a second time. Lord Delaware, despite all of his efforts, really never found that North America agreed with him that much. This time, however, instead of remaining sickly during his time in the colony, Lord Delaware would just go ahead and die on the journey over. Despite these problems, however, Jamestown was continuing to thrive during this time. When Captain Yardley returned for his second stint as colonial governor, and he had been the one who had been replaced by Argall in the first place, the colony was getting ready to enter into a period of massive growth. By this point, the view of the colony had changed. Jamestown was no longer seen as a place that was simply there to exploit the local resources of. Jamestown had become an outpost of England located in a foreign land. No longer satisfied with economic gain alone, Virginia was a foothold on the New World, a springboard for the English into further endeavors in colonization. One of the problems with the colony, however, is that it has become apparent by the middle part of the 16-teens that despite relative stability within the colony, the population had begun to stagnate. In 1616, there were only 324 people living in the colony, which is actually slightly down from the years before in 1611. Part of the problem is that while the colony had become much more stable, that stability came at the expense of harsh rule from Thomas Gates. This means that the stability of the colony was coming at the expense of these harsh living conditions. We have talked about the new laws in the colony and that the colony was essentially under martial law, and it's probably not too shocking that this isn't something that anybody was super excited about. The colony was also at this time facing a labor crisis. The indentured servants who had come over back in 1607 were now at the end of their period of being indentured. Well, not everybody at first, as we move past 1614, more and more people will begin to earn their freedom. This poses a serious issue for the Virginia Company, therefore, as they are going to face a crisis in making sure that people remained within the colony and didn't just head back to England. A secondary problem existed in the system that the English had put in place in 1612 to try to drive more people into the colony in the first place. If you recall, in 1612, by making a minimal investment in the colony, you could have 100 acres of land. The problem, though, is that the Virginia Company didn't really have the land to offer. To fix this problem, the Virginia Company turned to Edwin Sandus. Sandus had been one of the initial investors in the Virginia Company, and though he would never personally come to Virginia, he had always strived to support the colony from the ground back in London. Well, the colony was certainly more stable. The task fell to Sandus to take the colony to its next phase. To do this, Sandus hoped to make the population of Jamestown more self-sustaining. 
Sanders believed that by increasing the number of people in the colony, that it would also move the colony closer to financial security. While stability existed, profitability was still a serious issue for the Virginia Company. Tobacco had become their cash crop, but maintaining the colony was still not really a profitable endeavor. Now, Sandus knew that the Virginia Company did not have the financial ability to entice people to come to the colony. Instead, what he did was offer those willing to travel to Virginia special administrative and judicial rights. Sandus was also actively trying to change the balance in the colony. Today, the colony has been overwhelmingly male. Under the leadership of Sandus, you start to see more women make their way to the colony. Likewise, Sandus also increased the number of artisans coming over to the colony. The hope was that by diversifying the colony's population, you're going to be able to draw even more settlers there. The most influential change during this time, however, was the introduction of the Virginia headright system. Knowing that the shareholders in the company needed some kind of a benefit, as cash dividends weren't really in the cards at the moment, Sandus introduced the concept of a headright in Virginia. The headright system, instead of being a dividend in cash, would provide colonists with a dividend of 100 acres of land. For those who had come to the colony since 1616, at their own expense, a grant would be given of 50 acres, plus an additional 50 acres for each person they paid to come across the Atlantic. As an effort to increase the holdings of the Virginia Company, the decision was made that the land given out would be on plots separated by approximately 10 miles. Now, recall from last week, this is going to be a really big deal when we start talking about the massacre of 1622. If you'll recall, the distance between the plots is going to make the attack by Obashenkano that much more devastating. With the growing number of land claims, the decision was also made to divide the colony into four boroughs. Those boroughs are going to be Charles City, Henrico, Kikatan, and Jamestown. The division into boroughs would make the administration of the colony simpler and would allow for future growth. Sandus had also come to realize that the current form of government inside the colony was something of a problem. It was standing in the way of future progress. Nobody wanted to live under a system of martial law. We also know that, as things became more stable in the colony, the harsh laws were not going to be strictly followed anyway. This means that the colony had an exceptionally strict law code that was being ineffectively applied. Following the last set of law reforms following the starving time, there was a sense of anger and aggravation amongst many of the shareholders living in Virginia. After all, they had these new laws thrust upon them without any real say. The settlers couldn't easily head back to London for the meetings. Therefore, Sandus, understanding the importance of the shareholders having some stake in the company despite being in Virginia, not London, decided to do something a bit more radical. The solution that Sandus proposed was to give those settlers more of a say over the daily affairs in Jamestown directly. These were the shareholders on the ground, and keeping them happy was critical. In a moment, we are going to discuss the new laws and their effect. However, First, I want to make sure we are all clear about the rights actually being conveyed. Remember that up until 1624, the colony is a company. It is not, strictly speaking, a royal colony. Representation at this stage is on a company level. It is not conveying voting rights on a national scale. The government of the colony is rules and regulations of the company. We still are dealing with a corporate hierarchy, not with a government directly. And... While this doesn't really qualify as representative government in its truest form, it's a start and therefore it's something worth discussing. The decision was made in 1618 to instruct the governor of Virginia to form the first representative form of government in Virginia. A year later, in August 1619, this would become a reality. The new system was set up with a governor, the governor's council, and two representatives from every hundred who would be elected by the inhabitants of Jamestown. The group would meet once per year and would have the power to enact measures for the good of the colony. The governor would have veto power, and all the laws would have to fit within the existing English laws, so they couldn't do anything crazy and, you know, diverge from the laws of England. Of course, the company back in London still actually held the ultimate veto power. The Virginia House of Burgesses would meet for the first time in 1619 and would remain in place up until 1624. We are going to discuss the events of 1624 in a few minutes, but first I want to go through some of the laws that we are going to see the House of Burgesses pass. Looking at these laws that are enacted are going to give us an interesting snapshot into the life of the colony during that period. 
we are going to look at two sets of laws here. The first set was enacted in 1619, and the second set was enacted in 1624. When looking at the laws of 1619, the first thing we see the General Assembly concerned about is that the English settlers do nothing that might endanger the current peace between the colony and the Indians. In fact, relations with the Indians is one of the primary things that the legislature is concerned with in 1619. Laws included regulating the trade between the settlers and the Indians. In regards to Indian relations, there is a section going further in depth about the conversion of the Indians. And I'm going to briefly quote directly from the laws of the first General Assembly in regards to this. Be it enacted by this present assembly that for laying a sure foundation of the conversion of the Indians to the Christian religion, each town, city, borough, and particular plantation do obtain unto themselves by just means a certain number of the native children to be educated by them in true religion and civil course of life, of which children the most towardly boys in wit and grace of nature to be brought up by them in the first element of literature so as to be fitted for college intended for them, that from thence they may be sent to work of conversion. The laws regarding the Indians are of particular interest. Now, we know, of course, because of what we saw last week, that in 1622 there is going to be a huge Indian massacre. Well, this document makes clear that as of 1619 at least, the events of that caliber weren't really on the minds of the settlers. In fact, there is an ongoing discussion regarding conversion it is a strong indication that the opposite is actually true. They were not expecting an attack. Conversion of the Indians to Christianity is not going to be a short-term project. Rather, it's a long-term project in the interest of in improving the relations and understanding between the groups moving forward. This tells us that, looking at this time, they're not worried about some sneak attack. After all, the settlers are not going to be wasting their time converting a group of people who they think are on the verge of attacking them. It also shouldn't be lost here that the very first thing addressed in the code has to do with keeping the peace between the Indians and the English. The English depended on the stability of this relationship, especially as the colony grew past Jamestown and into something larger. And as we've discussed previously, it is those good relationships that have allowed the settlers to expand beyond the fort and take bigger and bigger claims of land. Incidentally, this is also going to be what's going to lead to the massacre of 1622. As of at least 1619... The last thing the English would have wanted is conflict with the Indians that could endanger the peace that had become the standard. At the same time, the emphasis on new laws goes to show how tenuous the settlers knew that peace to be. They needed that peace to continue growing and wanted to make sure that nothing got in the way of that. Beyond laws dealing with the Indians, the majority of the laws are dealing with production, lessons that were mostly born out of the starving time. These laws regulate how much each individual person had to grow for the colony. There were laws against idleness, and my personal favorite is the community swear jar, which was a law requiring that a person caught swearing would need to pay five shillings and acknowledge their mistake in church. In general, these laws pretty closely resemble the laws that we see Thomas Dale bring to the colony, with the chief difference being that not everything warranted a death sentence. Overall, however, while the punishments were subdued from their original document, the overall rules being put into effect are basically the same. Ultimately, this is all going to lead to a constitution for the assembly in Virginia to be drafted. I would give a word of caution that the word constitution in this case is somewhat misleading. This constitution wasn't written by the colonists, but was rather written back in London. The document essentially stood as the written declaration of what the colonists had done two years before that first assembly. The House of Burgesses would meet again in 1624. While the second set of laws were shorter, there are still some interesting things to take away from it. In this version, there is nothing designed to keep the peace between the Powhatan people and the settlers anymore. And that makes sense as we are now two years post-massacre. With the massacre of 1622 looming so large, it should not be a shock that a lot of the new rules had to deal with that directly. For instance, one of the proposed rules is that March 22nd be made into a holiday. Beyond that, the new proposals do feature several rules set to protect the colonists from future aggressions, and these included laws stating that the colonists needed to be armed when traveling and working in their fields. While well, things certainly had become better with time in the colony, financially, the colony was an absolute mess. There are several factors working against Jamestown that continue to be exacerbated by the problems back in London. First, despite being better than it once was, the death rate in Virginia was still terrifyingly high. Between 1618 and 1622, around 4,000 settlers made their way into the colony. 
only about a quarter of them actually survived. Even into the early part of the 1620s, the death rate is just simply unsustainable. Further, problems centered around the fact that the Virginia Company desperately wanted to see the installation of a manufacturing base in the colony. Going way back, recall that in 1607, they did have some success in this endeavor back in the Popham Colony. Up in that colony, they had managed to build a ship, showing that, hey, it's at least possible to build a ship in the New World. In order to set up that manufacturing base in Virginia, the company insisted on sending over a steady supply of craftsmen. Once arriving in the colony, however, these men had little idea of how to actually survive the Virginia wilderness, and as it turned out, were ill-suited for tasks like farming. The industrial base that the company wanted never really formed up, leaving the colony with a large number of settlers whose skills are largely wasted. Back at home in London, the company had come to depend on lotteries for funding. However, King James I had become concerned about the practice of this lottery, which were not always as ethical as he might have hoped for. In 1621, the king suspended the lottery, which had the effect of cutting off the best source of revenue that the colony had at that point. All of this on top of the fact that the investors had begun to figure out that Jamestown was just a money pit, and they found themselves less excited about making investments. Sure, tobacco provided some relief, but far from enough to get the colony into a stable financial footing. With the Virginia Company struggling to stay afloat, the massacre of 1622 happened. With so many dead, there was little the beleaguered company could do to stop this from becoming a major scandal. In April of 1623, the Privy Council appointed a seven-man commission led by William Jones to look into the company. The Privy Council also ordered that the Virginia Company send backup to help secure the safety of Virginia. However, by this point, the Virginia Company had reached its breaking point. Despite the order to send backup, the Virginia Company lacked the funds to supply the needed help. This caused the Privy Council to launch legal proceedings, and in May of 1624, the Virginia Company's charter was dissolved. The dissolution of the Virginia Company opened up a whole lot of questions for the colonists. The first thing that happened after the collapse of the company is that the colony was put into the hands of Lord Manville, who acted as something of a caretaker. Manville set out to gauge the actual status of the colony and decide what the best action to take was. While that was going on, James I dies and Charles I becomes the king. After spending some time thinking about how to handle the situation, Charles affirmed the findings of the Privy Council that the colony had been founded for the propagation of the Christian religion and the increase of trade, and enlarging his royal empire. The only major change initially, at least, is that the colony was now going to be controlled by a governor and a royal council answerable directly to the king, instead of being answerable to the Virginia Company. For the colonists actually in Virginia, the biggest concern was basically anything that could disrupt their increasingly lucrative tobacco trade. However, these fears appear to be for naught. Ultimately, the decision was reached that gave Virginia a virtual monopoly over the home market. This was done by enforcing laws that would exclude all foreign and domestic tobacco other than what was being produced in Virginia. The tobacco growers in Virginia were not about to complain about this situation and merely went about their way. But what about the House of Burgesses that we see established in Virginia? Charles I was silent about it. Though it would make for a nice story that Charles I ignored the House of Burgesses in Virginia because of his deep hatred for Parliament, and that his goal was to destroy any form of representative government, that probably isn't true. But, I mean, it's at least worth considering. After all, and spoiler alert if you don't know where this is going, Charles I's relationship with Parliament is so bad that it is going to spark the English Civil Wars and end with him being beheaded. And, well, that is an interesting thought to believe that his ignoring the House of Burgesses in Virginia is a sneak preview of things to come. The evidence really just doesn't bear this out. More likely, Charles I ignored the House of Burgesses because he just simply didn't care. The House of Burgesses was not the equivalent to Parliament. It really wasn't even close. Rather, it was simply a board that helped run the daily activities of the colony, not something that somebody like Charles I needed to concern himself with. And to be clear, it's not that Charles disbanded the House of Burgesses. He just ignores it. Charles first moves to appoint a permanent governor for the colony. He selects Sir Francis Wyatt for that task. And while the crown would remain officially silent on the matter, Wyatt and future governors did find it useful to occasionally call on the council to deal with matters in the colony, even if they didn't have the official recognition. While they would meet infrequently, Wyatt would still choose to call the House of Burgesses from time to time. The use of the council in many ways was a necessity. 
for the governors, they only had limited ability to enforce their will. Wyatt and subsequent governors don't really have the ability to induce the settlers to do anything that they didn't want to do. They would have understood that they were badly outnumbered without a method of enforcing their demands. In other words, if the governor made a demand and the colonists didn't want to do it, it's not like the governor could really do anything about it. In this regard, the council proved to be a useful tool to get things done. If popular consent was already required to have their laws function, they might as well use the council to help deal with the issues as they arose. Charles would ultimately come around in 1639 and authorize Wyatt to call the House of Burgesses once a year, or as often as necessary. What had started in 1619 as a mechanism to give the shareholders in the Virginia Company some control over their own affairs had become officially recognized by the Crown. Charles recognized that the Assembly, along with the power of the Governor and the Royal Council, shall have power to make acts and laws for the government of that plantation, corresponding as near as they can to the laws of England. Life under the Crown was generally viewed positively, after a few years' worth of adjustment. Under the Crown, the colonists gained more flexibility on their ability to move goods. As some of the more restrictive company rules were done away with, the Crown likewise encouraged private land ownership, which helped accelerate the rate of colonial growth. With the Powhatan tribes being supplanted following 1622, new settlers coming to the colony had far more ability to extend past the boundaries of the colony and further out into the frontier. This comes at a good time as the population of Jamestown would finally begin to grow substantially. Tobacco would remain the staple crop under the crown, as it had been during the time of the Virginia Company. The crown, in much the same vein as the Virginia Company, sought to diversify the business of the colony. Part of the problem was that Virginia was producing tobacco at a rate that outpaced demand. This led to large amounts of surplus and subsequently sent prices for tobacco tumbling. Recognizing that dependency on a single crop put the colony in a precarious position, the Crown saw the need to keep the colonists from putting all their eggs in a single basket. The Crown's answer was sent along with the new governor, Sir William Berkeley, who brought with him plans to introduce new forms of business to the colony and diversify the otherwise limited economy. Primarily, the hope was that the colony could establish additional stable crops that would help further grow the colony and support it should the tobacco industry collapse completely. When Berkeley arrives in 1641, he would attempt to establish hemp, flax, pitch and tar as other staples of Virginia, with the hope being that he would be able to have Virginia emerge as a leader in tanning hides and leather. Berkeley also brought with him plans to attempt to introduce silkworms to turn Virginia into a silk-producing region. Unfortunately for the English crown, Berkeley had about as much success in introducing new crops as the Virginia company had before him. Tobacco was the staple crop of Virginia, and the colonists were plenty happy to keep it that way. The growth of tobacco would also have a major effect on the future of both Virginia and largely the American South and how towns and cities were formed. The English crown had wanted to consolidate the settlers into towns and cities, as these are naturally more defensible. Berkeley in particular had attempted to drive people towards the towns. Now, we have already seen an example of what happens when people get too spread out. Remember, that's one of the big problems in 1622, was just how spread out the plantations had become. In the fortification of Jamestown, they were far less affected than those who had left the safety of the main settlement. It was the people on their plots outside that ended up dead. The problem with this is that tobacco is a particularly land-hungry crop, and it requires a lot of space to grow. And furthermore, there are questions of transportation that must always be answered. Today, we often take for granted how easy it is to move mass amounts of goods around. During 1640s Virginia, however, it was not as simple as simply loading up a truck and shipping it away. Enough product was being produced that shipping it by land was always going to be ineffective. With shipping tobacco by land being difficult at best, the best solution became to set up near a river and skip the product down the river to a larger port, load it on a ship, and then send it off to England. That means that colonists needed to have river-adjacent land to set up shop. The result is that towns never really worked well in an economic system based on the plantation. What emerges in the South is a series of large counties that handle the administration of justice, policing, and other necessary civic functions. The population of the South will continue to rely largely on plantations moving forward. This means that the population density that we see in the South is going to remain far below what we see emerge in the North. 
With the Crown being pleased at the developments in Virginia, the decision was made to establish a second Chesapeake colony. Charles I named the colony after his wife, Henrietta Maria, otherwise known as Queen Mary in England. Charles I gave control of this new 12 million acre colony to Lord Baltimore. The colony was set up as a proprietary colony. This means that the colony was designed to be run by private interests, similar to how the Virginia Company had run Jamestown. This was initially the more common method that the Crown chose to establish colonies with, as it is significantly easier and cheaper to administer for the government. As time went on, especially as we move into the 18th century, however, we are going to see the rise of the Crown Colony. A Crown Colony was a colony directly run by the English Crown. Lord Baltimore had two goals when he came to Maryland. The first was the common goal for everybody in Virginia, make money. The second goal was to establish a place where Catholics, like Baltimore himself, could find a degree of religious toleration. Charles I, by all accounts, was sympathetic to Catholicism, and his wife Queen Mary was a staunch Catholic. Charles I had envisioned Maryland as being a place where both Protestants and Catholics could live together in peace. Catholics, however, ended up not immigrating in droves to Maryland, and instead we see largely Protestant colonies emerge. A sizable portion of the colony were people from Virginia who were moving up there to Maryland just because there was more land up there. By this point in Virginia, land had become a precious resource, and competition was high for the best plots. Maryland simply offered new opportunities. Likewise, land was initially cheap. If a person could pay their own way, they could take advantage of a generous headright system that gave 100 acres per adult, regardless if that adult was free or was a servant as well as 50 acres for any child under 16. The men coming up from Virginia moved to these large plots of land and quickly began growing tobacco. Almost immediately, Maryland would become a major tobacco-producing colony. With the addition of Maryland, the English found themselves in control of a large portion of the Atlantic coast. What had begun as a small island had spread into areas including two major colonies and controlled much of the Chesapeake. I do very briefly, and I really do mean very briefly, want to address the question of the English Civil War in Virginia. Okay, so what is the English Civil War? The English Civil War was a conflict between the English monarch Charles I and Parliament. Without going into all the issues between the King and Parliament, here is what you need to know for right now. King Charles went to war against the English Parliament, which was led by Oliver Cromwell. Cromwell in Parliament would be successful in following the Second English Civil War, Charles I was tried for treason and executed. Cromwell would become the leader of the Commonwealth that would last up until 1660, ending with the restoration of the monarchy under the command of the son of Charles I, the aptly named Charles II. So that is the English Civil War in like 20 seconds. The reason we aren't going to spend a ton of time on this subject is because the outcome in the colony was relatively minor. Virginia remained loyal to the king, and after the death of Charles I, they were quick to proclaim Charles II as the new king. Parliament, not being amused by this development, was already in a dispute with the colonies regarding the Navigation Acts and free trade. The Navigation Acts sought to limit the trade in the Virginia colony to only English merchants. The colonists had little interest in having their trade restricted and openly resisted these changes. Now, this does lead Parliament to briefly blockading Virginia, forcing them to surrender in 1652 and accept parliamentary authority. In the negotiations that came along with the eventual surrender, the Assembly was able to negotiate with Parliament and secure their free trade. Governor Berkeley was forced to resign as governor. However, Parliament really didn't do a whole lot beyond that. They allowed the colonies to continue relatively free trade. Furthermore, they allowed the colony to elect their own governor. When Charles II came into power with the Restoration, Virginia was quick to point out that they had always remained loyal to the monarchy and had held out against parliamentary authority for as long as they possibly could. And this was aided by the fact that shortly prior to the Restoration, the English elected Sir William Berkeley as their governor. This means that right before they learned about the restoration, they had voluntarily elected the former king's appointee. Not a bad way to show Charles II that they had remained loyal subjects of House Stuart. While the English Civil War does have some effect on the colony, however, in Virginia at least, the effects are going to be relatively minor. As we move through the colonies, we are going to stop and see how each responded to the Civil War, as there was far from a consensus stance in North America. 
what I will say is that we aren't going to see the dramatic effect from the English Civil War that we are going to see later when we look at the Glorious Revolution. The Glorious Revolution is going to be bringing a paradigm-shifting change throughout the colonies, including questions over their place in the English system. But that story is for much later. In regards to the English Civil War for right now, the effects in Virginia are relatively minor. Over the last seven episodes, we have tracked the growth and development of the Jamestown colony. From the initial group of settlers, we have seen the colony fight to survive against the elements, Indians, disease, and starvation. Where we now leave the colony, we see a stable and rapidly growing colony in Virginia. With the colony now comfortably on its feet, it is time for us to move on. When we return to Virginia next season, we are going to be looking at the second period of rule for William Berkeley, as the colony heads towards its first case of armed rebellion. However, for now, we will leave the Virginia colonists behind to tend to their plantations while we address the formation of the other major colonies. Before we do wrap this thing up for today, I would like to address a potential elephant in the room. You may have noticed that at no point have I discussed the question of slavery. After all, slavery is going to be a huge factor in trying to explain the political history of the United States. I have debated back and forth on how I was going to introduce the topic, as there is not a single good answer to explain the rise of slavery in the English colonies. My plan, therefore, is to address slavery in its own episode at the end of this first season. In that episode, I will go through and look at the introduction of slavery throughout the colonies and at the various reasons and causes behind it. I think this way we will be able to get a much better understanding of how slavery came to be throughout the colonies. However, that is all in the future, and for the time being, we are done in Virginia. Next time, we are going to begin our series looking at the colonies up in New England. This means that when we come back, we are going to be traveling back to England to answer the question of who are the Puritans and why do they want to start a colony? And, more specifically for next week, Who are those Puritans who came over that would become known as the Pilgrims? Those are the questions that we are going to be diving into beginning next time. I want to thank you all for listening thus far, and I look forward to seeing you back here in two weeks' time as we begin to dive into the New England colonies.